Thank you for watching the MAPS Global Podcast, where we discuss leadership and culture within the convergence of worship, prayer, and missions in your neighborhood and in the nations. Hey guys, we're back for another special podcast. I'm your host, Jules, and I'm so happy to be sitting down with a very special guest today. So happy to have her here in Richmond, Virginia. So right now, this is we're recording at AG24, which is our um, annual uh, conference where we invite leaders, friends, our spiritual family from all around the globe to come for one weekend, Thursday through Sunday, and we do worship, prayer, um, intercession, and uh, talk about what the Lord is doing in the 1040 window and how we can be part of it. It's just the best time. It's so amazing. Um, it's day one, and we just had our first noon prayer session, and I just got blasted. <laughs> so we were praying for the Himalayas, and there was just this insane Isaiah 6 moment that was happening, um, and people just absolutely getting marked for this mission space. Um, but anyway... That's what we're doing right now, and now I got a moment with Miss Bond from Eurasia. Hello, everybody. Miss Bond has been um, a missionary in Eurasia for four years. Yeah, and you've been with Maps for almost six, five, five years. But you also did um, our training program before. Yes. So six years total. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Well, that's amazing. Wow. That's crazy. And you've been in Eurasia for a full four years at our Eurasia mission space. Yep. Um, if I remember correctly, you were in our second wave of long-term missionaries that we sent to that base. Yes. So you came in probably around COVID time? It was September 2020. Okay. Dang. Right in the middle of COVID. And then at some point, tell me, at some point you transitioned and now you've been leading the prayer room in Eurasia? Tell me about that a little bit. Yeah, so for the last three years, I've been leading the HOP, the prayer room. We call it HOP, but yeah. It's... For secure language. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it was just kind of day-to-day -day ops at first, checking in with people, but now I've been given creative vision. Um recruiting people to do sets and I've been able to mm -hmm. put indigenous believers in Eurasia on prayer watches and to do devos and just empower their voice there so wow yeah what a dream job it literally is <laughs> best job I ever had that's mm -hmm. amazing and um are you on furlough right now not yet okay. I will be in the fall okay so your second furlough is coming up yes okay and you guys do those every 18 to 21 months yeah something right? like that okay yeah, that's amazing um well I just want to spend a little bit of time talking with you just interviewing you what it's like um in the house of prayer in Eurasia and just hearing like what is the Lord doing right now in this season in Eurasia yeah it's it's crazy. The Lord is moving all across Eurasia. It's just incredible to be a part of it. There's been an unheard of, unprecedented amount of salvations happening. Wow. Um, just in our own church community, we have people coming into our church plant on the other side of the city. They come a few weeks in a row, and then we direct them to our main church, which is in our neighborhood and then they come for a few months and then they get saved. Wow. And it's not even just in our church community, in our house of prayer community, it's all across the nation. Mm -hmm. Like our friends and other churches are also saying the same thing. They come and then they hear the gospel preached and they keep coming and then they realize that Jesus is who they wanna live for and they wow. give their lives to the Lord. Wow. All across the nation. Wow. I want to give a little context for the people listening, just what, a few stats about Eurasia. Sure. So Eurasia is 82, 83 million people, right? Yeah. Um, and it's a Muslim nation, and it's the most, peop like most Muslim people per capita. capita. Yeah. yeah. So it's like saturated yeah. uh, in Islam. And the neighborhood where we have the House of Prayer, there is a mosque on every corner. Wow. You can't turn anywhere without seeing a mosque. They're not necessary. They just build them because they want they want the sound of mm -hmm. Islam to go forth. 
but we're there praying and singing the name of Jesus in the yeah. midst of that. Yeah, it's crazy how the how Islam is just this false priesthood. Basically, I mean, it's the nature of God in us um, to to lift up to praise, to worship, to reflect what we see. And Islam is just like a warped version of what we're made to do. And it's it's honestly crazy how many times a day in a year that there's worship coming up to a false god. Five times a day. Five times a day. And I heard, okay, so something I heard about Eurasia is that there's something about they're, they're so loud that it sounds like go back and forth. Tell me about that a little bit. There are, where there are mosques that are really close together in some neighborhoods, they will echo. Like one of them will start, they'll mm -hmm. say like Allah Akbar, and that's them calling everyone to come pray. They'll go silent and then one nearby will do the same thing. And I've only been to, I think, one other Middle Eastern country. So I don't have a lot of comparison, but I have friends from other pl places in the region that have said, it, in Eurasia, the call to prayer is louder and longer mm -hmm. than other places. Wow. So it's just incredible what you guys are doing in the prayer room at the Eurasia mission space because you're actually training up local believers to stand in the house of God in these local churches, um, ministering to the Lord, uh, taking watches, playing their instrument, playing the local instruments, singing, even writing songs. They're writing songs so consistently that we can't even keep up with it. Wow. In, in the local language. In their local language. Oh they don't, most of them don't speak English. So like Dang. I'll walk in <sighs> and they'll just be like getting ready, doing a practice for worship or whatever. And I'll just be like, I haven't heard this song before. Is this yeah. new word? Like I need the words to put it on the screens. And they'll just say, oh, I wrote it. I'm just practicing. And I'm like, what? You wrote oh another gosh. song? You just wrote one last week. That's yeah, crazy. And all in the local language. That's amazing. Um, what a joy that you get to do that. Is it, how, how do you feel in your job? Like being a missionary in Eurasia, what are the types of feeling? Like, is it all joy? Is it all hardship? Like, tell me a little bit about what it's like to be a missionary there. You know, I think being a missionary is the hardest, but most joyful thing that I've done in my life. It's, it's not all butterflies and rainbows. Mm -hmm. um, it can be very lonely and it can be very hard, especially living in a Islamic world where you are hearing five times a day that God is not a father and he doesn't have a son. And sometimes you look around and you're like, is there any fruit? Is what I'm doing worth it? Yeah. And then you'll show up to the house of prayer or you'll talk to a non-believing local friend. And in the house of prayer context, somebody just wrote a new song. Or you talk to your local friend and they're like, I think I felt the presence of God when I was reading the Bible. What does that feel like? And you explain and then they're like, I felt that. Wow. And they're like, but how do I know it's the real God and who the real God is? And you say, it's Jesus that makes all the hardship, all the loneliness just so worth it. And it just, it fills me with a joy indescribable. And just personally, I just... I, I love this people group so much that I just love being alongside of them every day. I love to show up at the house of prayer and listen to them sing in their language. Like, we don't have to do it in English. I love that we do like a circle prayer instead of um, the way most American houses of prayer pray, because that's what empowers them to pray. Mm -hmm. And it just, it fills me with joy and, yeah. and excitement for, to be a missionary. Wow. That's so encouraging, honestly. Um, what, what would you say, um, like if you were talking to somebody who is considering missions from your perspective, being on the field, what would you tell them if they're, if they're considering it and they're like, I don't really know if I should be a missionary or not. What would some of your advice maybe be? Um, I think I would say if you feel like it's something the Lord would have you do, it will not be a waste of time. Um, a lot of people think that missions is not a real career and it very mm -hmm. much is a real career. And it's 
like I said, it can be hard, but it's it's not a waste of time. So I would encourage people if they feel just any draw at all, just to give their yes, even if it feels weak, because my yes started out very weak. It was just, a, I think I'm supposed to do this. I feel the Lord on this. He's speaking this to me. And once I said yes, the yes started getting stronger with the Holy Spirit and the Lord started opening the doors and making things clear. Mm -hmm. So I would just encourage people to give their yes to the Lord. And, and if people are in the waiting to like go on the field like embrace the waiting because the lord's timing is everything i i've been telling people all week as i've gotten to connect with other staff here at hq like embrace the waiting because if i had gone to eurasia before the lord sent me i don't know if i'd be there still today but because i leaned into waiting on the lord and his timing here we are four years later and when i go on furlough i'm gonna give another two years yeah. so the timing of the lord is everything and just trusting in that like you'll you'll go so far well that's amazing i feel like there's a like a necessary forming of a missionary that i feel like we don't really think about that when we get marked um for a nation or just in general for missions and we don't we just think oh, like my heart's on fire. I want to, I'm ready to go do that. But there's actually a forming process like you're talking about that involves time, leaders, dis spiritual disciplines. Sitting you know, in the just furnace. Like, yeah, just like daily mundane stuff of the Lord forming us and Absolutely. then suddenly thrusting us into yeah. an assignment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just been amazing to hear the fruit of you and your team members um, who've been thrust into Eurasia. So I I have another question I wanted to come back to about the houses of prayer in Eurasia because you've mentioned to me before um, that there's not just one. There's actually multiple, and there's even some that are like fully indigenous-led. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, so currently in Eurasia, there are seven active houses of prayer. And a few of those have been around for a little while. But in the last year, at least three of them have sprung up and they are all indigenous led. Like mm, pretty much no foreigners go. Yeah. They're welcome, but it's all indigenous led. Like it's not, there's not missionaries having to run it or like no. get stuff going. And yeah. Um, they're all based out of churches too. So it is the church and the house of prayer together. That's amazing. Yeah. And one thing I love about our, the Eurasia mission space is that the church and prayer, um, the church and prayer elements you're talking about, there's also a training element yeah. um, to that Antioch, which is our indigenous uh, training program for leaders. Um, do you have any testimonies from any of the students that have been trained? Yeah, in one of our last programs that we ran, the House of Prayer leader in the South, they just launched this year. He mm -hmm. did our training program. He came wow. in as just a quiet kid, um, didn't even want to be there. He was 19. Totally. He was 19. <laughs> His mom sent him there so that wow. he could grow. And now, he, like a year later, he's 20 years old. And he is leading the house of prayer in the South. Stop it. One of the cities that Jesus wrote to in the book of Revelation. Dang. Come on. Eurasia, Gen Z stepping up. Seriously. Running houses of prayer. Writing songs. In the local language. In the local language. It's just amazing. That is so cool. It, bon, we don't get to hear stories like this every day. So I'm so grateful that you're here. I'm so grateful that you took some a few moments to sit down and share on a special podcast. Um, and guys, if you are, if this has stirred your heart for missions, um, apply for our training schools, check out maps on our website. You can go to any of our social medias um, and just learn a little bit more about what the Lord is doing in the 1040 window. And we just pray that uh, this podcast blesses you and, and um, leads you closer to wherever the Lord is leading you, um, whether that be to the 1040 or church planting or even partnering and giving with missionaries like Bon, who can only do what they do because of partnership. So please pray for the Eurasian mission space. 
pray for the indigenous houses of prayer that are covering this nation right now, this unreached nation with a thriving local church that is just blossoming right now. Pray for them. Pray for even more salvations in this increased time. And we'll see you on the next podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the MAPS Global Podcast. Make sure to subscribe to this channel and check out previous episodes. Have you seen our 50 Hours documentary? Watch it now. And don't forget to sign up for our email newsletter.